I have an extraordinarily long text to read to you this afternoon, so open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, and I'll read to you verse 18. <laughs> And be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Let's look to our Lord now in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us, mercy and grace and watch care over us. I thank their Father for allowing us another opportunity to come into the house of the Lord and for each and every one that is here. And we pray, Father... Uh, that you would just uh, open up our hearts, ears, and minds, that we'd be open and receptive to thy word. May we know that, God, you can use us, and you do use your children. And then we have responsibilities as a child of God on how we are to live and walk and talk in this life. And so, Father, I pray that you would apply the teaching of your word to our hearts and our lives. Father, I pray that you would continue to be with me as thy servant. May you give me liberty and ability to present thy word in truth and in love. I ask, Father, that you would help us all be with us throughout this week and bring us back at the next appointed time. Forgive us of our sins. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The Spirit-filled walk. Paul continues to build on the foundation that he has been laying for us in this book. His basic command for the child of God is that we are to be different because we are in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We who were dead in trespasses and sin, God saved. And He saved us by His grace. And God, through His amazing grace, brought us out of death and depravity, and He delivered us from doom and promised us eternal life. Life forever with Him in, the, in, in heaven. When the Lord saved us through the power of the new birth, we were adopted into the family of God. And He transformed us into new creatures. And then he left us in this world to be a light that could be shed in this darkness. And so beginning now here in Ephesians 5 and verse 18 and continuing through the end of the book, Paul, under the inspiration of God, describes what the spirit-filled life looks like. Now, we, we've been going through, so nothing too outlandish or different here. We've already been learning in the last three, four, five weeks you know, the things that have been put aside, the things that are to be put off as the old man, and how we are to live as a new man. Well, God is continuing to do that here, but he just kind of changes the way that, and the context in it. And we all learn differently. And so uh, Paul is now kind of, you know, introducing this as the spirit-filled walk. And then the spirit-filled things that we will go through as a child of God. And I'll actually talk about that in the third part of the message. So Paul is describing what the Spirit-filled life looks like, and that should be the life that it looks like, or this should be the life that it looks like for every single born-again believer. But the reality is, is that it doesn't look this way for every child of God. Why? Why not? Because every child of God is not being obedient to the very word of God. <laughs> and, yeah, so that's it. I'll leave that there. But these are foundational truths that have power to transform us. And so, continuing now with the walk, remember we learned the first thing that we see as believers is that we are to have that spirit-filled walk. And we covered that. And then, then we talked about how we are to be light in the Lord. And then we... Talked about our wisdom of the Lord, right? The wisdom-filled walk. Now I'm going to talk about the spirit-filled walk. Well, it demands our submission. It demands our compliance. It demands control. God's control. And it demands consistency. I know mostly C's, but one S, because I don't know another word for submission. I began with C. So you all get out your thesauruses, and if you want to tell me it, then I'll put it in there and we'll make it all seize. But it demands submission. Now most of the message 
message that I'm going to preach today will revolve around the phrase, or the verb phrase, be filled. One of the interesting components of the phrase is the fact that it is the middle voice in the Greek. Do you all know what I mean by the middle voice? Because <laughs> I sure didn't before this. So, in the Greek, and sometimes really kind of being used in the English language, there are three basic voices, basic voices in which verbs can be written. Two of which are very familiar to us, while the third, and the one that is used here, is, is not as familiar. Those verb voices are this. An active verb. Active. The subject acts. The boy hit the ball. The passive voice, the subject is acted upon. The boy was hit by the ball. No, I'm not talking about me. <laughs> and the third one is that middle voice, and the one that we're less familiar with, and the subject acts upon himself. The boy hit himself with the ball. <laughs> Again, no. <laughs> Y'all got these visions of me, don't you? <laughs> is that a little bit better than that. I mean, Alan was talking about how he can throw the football 45 yards. Psh, it's nothing. 48. That's where I'm at. Not. I always lose in the football throwing contest. Why are you laughing? All right. So those are those three, you know, familiar or not so familiar, you know, voices in which verbs are written. So now watch this. We are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. But we know that we cannot make that happen. We cannot just decide to be filled with the Spirit and make it happen. Yet, the Lord commands us to be filled with the Spirit. So how can this be? Well, the middle voice in this verse tells us that God will fill us but it's when we submit or we yield our lives to Him. The same voice is used in the first phrase of this verse, where the Bible says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. A person becomes intoxicated when they yield control of their lives to the power of alcohol. A person must surrender to the action of picking up the bottle or the glass and taking that first drink. And if that person continues to consume alcohol, they will become drunk because they yielded themselves to alcohol. And so if we're going to fulfill this command, and it is a command, to be filled with the Spirit, then we must surrender ourselves to the Lord in this matter. We must begin to be filled with the Spirit. We are to be filled. We should be so filled with the Spirit that when a mosquito bites us, it leaves singing, there's power in the blood. <laughs> Woo, all right, good. I got your attention this afternoon. I think the first part of the message is all the humor that I'm going to have. But at least you're awake as we go through it. But we are to be so filled with the Spirit that others see Christ. And that really is the emphasis of what Paul will be preaching here throughout the duration of, again, the book of Ephesians. When we talk about the Spirit-filled walk, we, who are the children of God, are to be filled with the Spirit of God. And in order to do that, we must submit to it. So, um, for again, and I'm really going to illustrate out that alcohol to being filled with the Spirit um, analogy, but in order for a person to be controlled by alcohol, they have submitted to the bottle. They have yielded to the glass. They have yielded to the drink. So we must be yielded. We must be in submission to God the Holy Spirit. And then, the, I mean, of course, being filled with the Spirit is a positive. And Paul uses the contrast. I didn't want you all to get scared on me here. I will explain now. And, and contrast, of course, being filled with alcohol is, is a negative. It is wicked, right? So we'll get to that. So it demands submission. It demands us to be yielded. Secondly, it demands compliance. The verb phrase is also written in the imperative mood. You all... Didn't know I was so, like, grammatically smart, did you? I'm not. It just 
fit well with one of the commentators. I was like, ooh, I'll use that and sound intelligent. An imperative is a command. So, when the Bible says, be filled with the Spirit, it is not optional. Either we are filled with the Spirit, or we are out of God's will. The Bible is filled with commands. Filled with telling us things that we are to do, and filled with command telling us what we are not to do. And this is a command. God is speaking to us as his children in this verse, and he says, but be ye, or I'm sorry, not ye, there's no ye there, but be filled with the Spirit. God tells us to be filled with the Spirit. That is a command of God. God expects us as his children to be filled with the Spirit. Just like God expects us as his children to refrain from cursing, to refrain from stealing. God expects us as his children to not commit adultery, to not covet, or just like he expects us to be holy, to tithe, to show up to church, and to witness. Right? All of those are commands. Some of what we're not to do and some of what we are to do, all of which we are expected to do as a child of God. We must submit to the commands of God. So yeah, there are some that follow closely after the Lord and they are filled with the Spirit of God and you're like, wow, if I could just have that, if I could just be filled with that Spirit. Well, child of God, if you've been saved by the grace of God, you can by the power of God through the Word of God. <laughs> And so all of these things can come together. So we must, again, it demands compliance, and that is obeying the word of God. When the Lord gives a command, again, he expects his people to obey the command. And when we obey the Lord, it is proof of our love for him. In John chapter 4 and verse 15. John chapter 14 and verse 15, excuse me. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's what he tells us. Now, beloved, I have given my children commands within our family. And as a loving father, I expect them to obey them. Now, not to obey me over God, certainly, but to obey the commands of our house. Now everyone within my house has made a profession of faith, and so everyone in my house and every child of God that is in here today is to obey the commands of God first. But as an earthly father, and of course as my dear wife, as she is at the home throughout the day, we expect our children to obey what we have told them. To do and not to do. Right? Now, my wife and I were not unreasonable when we set the commands. We set the expectations that they were to follow. So when we went to a restaurant, or when we went to a home, or when we went out in public, we told them before we got there what we expected of them. Four, five, six, seven times. As they get a little older, we tell them a little bit less. But don't think that we have stopped telling them what our expectations are of them, even at their current ages. And then we, when we've set those expectations of them, we expect them to follow. Now God has told us how we are to behave, amen? God has told us how we're to behave in the world, in His church, and we as God's children are expected to follow the commands of God. And the father is well pleased when what? When his, when his children obey him. An earthly father is pleased when his children obey him. It's true. And so much the more our God, our heavenly father, is pleased when we obey him. So God left us again his perfect word, which he tells us his commands and expectations. And here we learn. So whatsoever God tells us to do in this manner, I am to do without question and without hesitation. We are to obey God and to be filled with the Spirit. So it demands our compliance. 
Secondly, it demands his control. So we read the verse again and we see this contrast of being drunk and then being filled with the Spirit. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So the image that Paul uses for being filled with the Spirit is an interesting one. Sure, absolutely. He sets up a contrast between a person who is under the control of alcohol and a person who is under the control of the Holy Spirit. So let's examine that for a few moments. A person comes under the power of alcohol, again, as I said earlier in the message, when they yield control of their lives to alcohol. They choose to drink, and when alcohol is given an inch, it will always take a mile. And so a person comes under the power of the Holy Spirit, again, when they yield control of their life to God. Now, a person who yields to alcohol soon finds out that it is the alcohol that takes over. It consumes everything in the individual and brings them under its control. Alcohol then controls the way a person thinks, uh, the way a person speaks, the way a person walks, the way a person acts, the way a person sees, and the way a person hears. It controls a lot of the person when they're under the influence or control of alcohol. It so dominates the life that a person under its control will often say and do things that they have no memory of the next day. I don't know about you all, but I like remembering. <laughs> I like knowing where I'm at, and I like knowing what I'm doing. Right? Alcohol takes over, and it produces the fruit of its control, which is excess. The word means to be a prodigal, to be wicked, or to live wickedly. The word is synonymous with the lack of refrain. So alcohol loosens our control, weakens restraint, and cripples the ability to discern right from wrong. The control of alcohol is pictured for us in the book of Proverbs, chapter 23. Now, we understand that we use wine for the Lord's Supper, and we will continue to do that. The Bible says here, and be not drunk with wine. The Bible talks about drunkenness, losing control, yielding to the control of alcohol. In Proverbs chapter 23, verses 29 through 35, talks about this control. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? Have you ever known an alcoholic? It's basically a description of them right there. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself awry. At the last, it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I have felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. A true alcoholic cannot wait to wake up the next day and start drinking again. So they have come under the control of alcohol. Now, in like manner, on the positive. A person who yields or submits, as a part, first part of the message, to the Holy Spirit will find that he, that is God, the Holy Spirit, takes over. Praise God. And so, instead of producing an excess of wickedness, the Holy Spirit will produce an excess of holiness in every life that he fills. You see, when the Spirit of God fills a life, he what? Controls how a person thinks, speaks, walks, acts, sees, and hears, right? Does that new life do all of that that I mentioned for us? Well, sure it does. We've been preaching about that for the last, I don't know, however many weeks. 
that when God takes over, he made a change. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so when we are filled with the Spirit of God, behold, all things become new. We must yield to the power and the control of God, the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. When God takes over, he produces that fruit of his control, also known as the fruit of the Spirit. The contrast between the life lived in the flesh and the one lived in the Spirit has also been pointed out multiple times in Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and all of those. You see, alcohol produces an excess of wickedness, and the Holy Spirit will produce an excess of holiness that will affect every area and relationship in your life. So, we are to be filled with the Spirit of God. So that people can see that God has control of our life. You can look at an alcoholic or a drunk and see that alcohol has control. We point that out to our children in, in some movies or sometimes or some things that we can see how alcohol takes control. Um, in, the, in the movie, The Case for Christ, and that is the uh, story of um, Lee Strobel, who was an atheist. A, a very staunch atheist. He was a drunk. He did mean things as a drunk. Um, you could see when the alcohol took his control, and we would explain to our children that that's what, and we, I mean, when they were younger, we would call it the bad drink. It does. It takes over, it takes control. Now, again, if you're not, I read and told you a little bit about Lee's trouble. If you're not familiar with that, he set out to prove his case. He made uh, you know, wanted to prove that God uh, was not real. He was a journalist for uh, the Chicago Tribune or something, Chicago. And uh, he set out to prove that. But then uh, the evidence for Christ is so overwhelming and so evident that uh, God saved him. And now he is a, uh, a preacher and a minister for Christ. And so there's a lot more to his story than that. But it shows that control. You know, again, it showed the control of alcohol and then the control of God, the Holy Spirit. Right? So we're to be filled with God, the Holy Spirit. And people ought to see that God has the control of our life. Amen? People ought to see that there's a difference in us. Sure, absolutely. And so we are to be filled with the Spirit that people can see God's control. So beginning next week in chapter, or chapter 5 and verse 19, and continuing through chapter 6 and verse 19, Paul gives us commentary on the Spirit-filled life. He tells us that we are to have a spirit-filled worship life in verses 19 and 20. We'll see that. And then we are to have a spirit-filled married life in verses 21 through 32. The Spirit of God will make us better spouses. And then the Spirit of God will make us better parents and better children. And so we are to have spirit-filled family life. And then the Spirit of God will make us better employees and better employers. And we are to have a Spirit-filled work life in Ephesians 6, 5 and through 9. And then the Spirit of God will make us better soldiers. And, uh, and, and, and so then we are to have that spiritual or that Spirit-filled warfare. And then the Spirit of God will make us better and more effective prayer warriors. And so we are to have a Spirit-filled prayer life in Ephesians 6, 18 and 19. All of these things, we are to be filled with the Spirit. And may that overflow from us. Right? May the Spirit of God be in excess that people would see Christ in us. May people see the Spirit of God is in control in our lives. In Romans chapter 8, and verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. May people see Christ in us. The Spirit of God should not merely have a place in our lives, but we know that he has, should have the preeminence in our lives. And so we need to submit and yield to him. The truth is that our bodies are nothing but as one author put it, so don't make fun of me, stacks of meat, bone, and tissue. That's all we are. The body must be energized by a spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, breathed into us the breath of life. And so when we are energized by our natural spirits, we will produce 
We will be in sin and ungodliness as we learned in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. But when we submit control of our lives to God, we are energized by His Spirit and He will produce His fruit in our lives. <coughs> so, what energizes you? What energizes you? We are to be filled. We are to be filled. Be filled with the Spirit. That should be our energy. To be filled to the top, lacking nothing. When we are filled with the Spirit, there is no room left for us. Amen? Think on that for a second. When you're filled with the Spirit of God, that means there's no room left for Justin Meyer. And isn't that the way it should be? You shouldn't see Justin. You should see Christ. You should see Christ. That Christ has total control of me and of all of us. And then thirdly, or fourthly, fifthly, I don't know where we're at. Fifth, fourthly, it demands consistency. The verb to be filled is in the present tense. It speaks of ongoing action. We could read it this way. But you being completely filled with the Spirit. The command is for us to be filled with the Spirit every moment and every day of our lives. And I know that's a tall order. Because as we learned this morning, it is possible both to be filled with faith and in the Spirit in one moment and then not in the next. What am I talking about? Why well, talk about Peter? Remember I told you he was really filled with the Spirit when he had the faith to step off of that boat. And then just like that, he looked away. He wasn't filled with the Spirit then. He was filled with fear and anxiety. And God rescued and saved. So whether we admit it or not, this is a problem we deal with. Again, one minute we're enjoying the wonderful presence of God, and the next minute we find ourselves entertaining a wicked thought. One minute we're focused on the Word of God, and the next minute we're acting in selfish ways. So we ask God to forgive us of our sins, and ask Him to fill us with the Spirit. I mean, that's what He tells us. He tells us to be filled with the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit. Let us submit to that. When we keep this, it is life-changing. It can transform our home. Imagine every member of our home being filled with the Spirit. We would love, honor, and cherish one another, ever seeking the Lord's will in our lives and in the operation of our homes. Oh, we need the power of the Spirit of God in our homes. Being filled with the Spirit would transform our marriages. If both spouses were filled with the Spirit, and certainly we'll be talking about that here in the next couple of weeks, we would treat one another with respect, putting the other ahead of self, and we would ever be seeking the Lord's best for our spouse. We need the power of God, the Spirit, in our marriages. It would transform our churches. If every member of the church was filled with the Spirit, we would come to church seeking the Lord's will. We would come ready to worship seeking the Lord. We would be more ready to be doers of the words and not hearers only. We would come in excited about the Lord and serving and worshiping Him. We would be ready, willing, and equipped to go into the world and preach the gospel, to be salt and light. And to be filled with the Spirit to transform the world. If every child of God in the world would be filled with the Spirit, the world would see a difference. The world would see the gospel in action. The world would be constantly confronted with the saving message of the gospel of grace. The world would be transformed by an army of Spirit-filled believers who were carrying out the Great Commission. So, beloved, we are to have a Spirit-filled walk. May God help us in that, to be filled with the Spirit of God. I thank you for your attention to the Word of God. Shall we stand together and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer.